We'll continue these reflections on the Paschal Mystery. We uh, sort of left our blessed Lord in the hellishness of hell. And now remember he's dead so he can't uh, save himself. So his, his blessed soul must have been totally confident in the Father's promises. He had drunk the cup that he could not bear to drink, lost his identity as God uh, temporarily, but what was more important, uh, lost or felt separated from the beloved of his life, found himself in the horrendous situation of having to withdraw from the Father's love. In other words, if you've ever experienced unrequited love in some degree, you have an inkling of what's involved here because the Son or the Word of God is, is the Father's treasure, remember? And in the baptism in the Jordan, another incidentally step in Christ's identification with sinners. And the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, that is to say, the treasure of the Father. Listen to him, invitation, to contemplate exactly as we're doing this afternoon, the mystery of the divinity of Christ. And remember, we used Mary of Bethany's experience to indicate how for each of us, who were Christians at least, passing through or hanging out with the humanity of Christ in our thoughts, affections, and uh, service, one begins to perceive the divinity that is hidden in the ordinary gestures, attitudes, and words of this human being. But there's more than that. The contemplative dimension reveals that whoever you're talking to has this aspect of divinity, that at least they, they have the image of God dwelling in them. So even if they're going to murder you or blow you up, as in the case of terrorists, they still are lovable because they are at the deepest level, which they may not be aware of, the image of God. And so for the sake of the truth and of God, we, we, we continue to relate to them with a love. We can't love their deeds, but we can love them. And, uh, and this is... Uh, so important for today, I would think, when uh, we seem to be on the verge, if not in the midst of a uh, number of religious wars, which have, are certainly politically motivated in some degree, but it's so important that this contemplative dimension reduces the animosity or defensiveness from the great world religions from each other because they unfortunately have been responsible for a lot of violence. Not the religion itself, but the false selves of people who were using the religion for their own security or control or uh, approval needs. So Jesus' example then is the example of God emptying God's self, implying that you folks 
might be able <laughs> to be humble in some degree too. If I've given up God and being God for your sakes, maybe you could let go of some of your pretensions or, oh, and so on. But it's amazing, if you get bounced from a job you like, you feel you've been treated unjustly. At least I would. <laughs> but but on, by what standard are you, are you following? The example of God is uh, it's inspiring, to say the least. And this humility of God is is what we're invited to partake in. And it's the great protector and guarantee from our becoming over-elated or over-stuffed with ourselves because of the success of our spiritual journey or because we've accomplished something in our own eyes or somebody else thinks we have. Yes, we, sh we shouldn't deny the good that God has given us the grace to do but we shouldn't take any credit for it either. Um, grace is the work of God. We can only be instruments or, or channels and uh, not too good ones either. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so it, it, in a sense, there was uh, this understanding of the Eastern Orthodox Church itself is, seems very important because this is the rest that the Sabbath uh, symbolizes. A rest from every uh, self-centered human striving, hence it's also a complete freedom, the freedom of God who has everything and thus doesn't need anything, so has no possessive attitude and, and hence no chance of being frustrated or, or disappointed or something like that. And, and these are the dispositions, freedom, peace, joy, love, that uh, we're invited to identify with. So this is a two-way street, perhaps if you recall in the book of Revelation, we, we read that the glorified Christ in speaking to one of the churches says, Behold, I stand at the door, that is your door, and knock. If anyone opens, I will come in and have supper with, with him or her and she or him with me. Notice the last phrase. This morning we went through the levels of ever deeper identification that God through Christ established with our situation, human condition, including the consequences of sin in the sense of alienation, separation, loneliness, guilt, shame, and all the rest of that stuff. So, so that's what Christ has has joined us and has come in to eat with us, a symbol in, in Palestinian culture of identifying with the values of the people you sat down with. That's why the Pharisees and even John the Baptist's disciples were so upset when Jesus ate with public sinners, because that was, that's what it meant. How, and they said uh, to G Jesus' disciples, how can your master do such a thing as to sit down with these these sinners, public sinners as they were. Uh, and so uh, he has identified with us, and I don't know whether you can exaggerate this. And, and it has great practical consequences for your own spiritual life in your life. It means that nothing in your life has to be separated from God. And that one's very sins or weaknesses or powerlessness or even addictions is, is something that God has joined. If you have it, he's got it in some way. 
that we don't quite understand, but uh, he, he, so that no matter who we are, where we are, uh, God has identified with us and is, is prepared to bring us out of whatever stress or damage we've done to ourselves or others to us. But it also means that now is the time for us to identify with him. In other words, we need to sit down with God, that is to say, and, and have supper with him. That's the invitation. And so this is the, this is the resurrection. This is what follows our sharing in the passion of Christ and the humiliation and hopefully humility that we experience from bearing with our faults and weakness and powerlessness, which is a, a significant part of the journey. The Christian journey is not a success story or a magic carpet to bliss. It's a series of humiliations of the false self. Hence, you're going to feel awful along the way insofar as you are identified with one of the emotional programs that, or the ego that has itself as the center of the universe. That's not a sin, it's just a mistake, but a serious one. So much of what we call sins are really mistakes of, or, or missing the point. Sin itself is, remember, is a symbol that is taken from the art of archery in the Hebrew times. And in the Hebrew, it, it means missing the mark. In other words, you have your goal, and then you have various circles, and then in the center, you have the bullseye, which in, in this image means uh, union with God or transformation into, uh, into God. So, so uh, as little children, you don't usually expect to hit the bullseye. And oddly enough, the best archers, it's an art lost art, I guess, in our culture, we prefer to shoot. But uh, the, the, uh, nobody expects a child to hit the bullseye. So you're lucky to hit the, hit the general chart. And, and the best you can do is once in a while to get the, uh, you know, hit one of the outer rings. So, so with, with that in mind, uh, some of our human faults or weaknesses that are a result of growing up without the experience of God and looking for happiness in the wrong places, this is part of, of the growing up process that is, is not a sin, but if we continue to be childish in our value systems and stick to the old uh, energy centers as our goals in life, this is when, as an adult, you begin to substitute these projects uh, for God, at least in the sense that we hope to find happiness in them. And, and so the contemplation enables us to diminish the energy that we put into those childish programs and thus to begin to be able to hit the mark, hit the bullseye. And so sin isn't going to go away by our resolutions, but rather by our gradual healing of the sources in us that in that are tendencies to sin or incline us to make mistakes with the hope of finding happiness that you'll never find in, in, in those energy projects. Um, so what happens then when we identify with Christ's passion? You've, we've done this already in baptism ritually. But in contemplative prayer, when you sit down in centering prayer, you really are joining Christ on the cross and sitting down with him. 
there was, in fact, in most crucifixions, a piece of wood that came out that the victim was sort of straddled, and this enabled them to suffer longer in the uh, malicious way that people were tormented in those days. So this, so we're now invited no longer to identify with our own projects for happiness, but to allow the divine gifts in us, namely the risen life of Christ, the mind of Christ, as Paul calls it, to be released in us. And these projects or these powers are just as present in us as the emotional programs for happiness or emotional traumas that we repressed into the unconscious. In other words, uh, the divine indwelling and the fruits and gifts of the spirit, theological virtues, are already empowerments that we have that we don't know how to use because we're too busy putting our energies in pursuing the other programs. When they diminish, through our identification with Christ and the empowerment of Christ, then the ontological unconscious, that is to say, these gifts that we actually have but never use, begin to appear with a certain spontaneity in our daily life. And, and, and this is what transforms human life and daily life into the continual presence of God. And, and that is the first of the uh, Beatitudes of a poor. The fear of God is a technical term in scripture. It doesn't mean the feelings. It means reverence or awe. Or, or more particularly, it means to be continuously in the presence of God. Spontaneously, so that God is, is present always in our uh, every aspect of life. So from the point of view of the Paschal mystery, uh, Holy Saturday concludes with the Paschal vigil, as it is called, in which uh, new uh, uh, Christians are baptized, if there are any, or the older Christians, such as ourselves, if that's your religion, renew our baptismal vows. That's the chief act on the, on the Paschal Vigil. And in doing so, deepen it. And especially if we're interiorizing the contemplative dimension of the gospel through some practice like centering prayer, one is identifying with the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. So one is as allowing the truth of our unconscious life, whether ontological or psychological, to, to uh, begin to uh, accept the divine light, life, and love that is the ripe fruit of Christ's resurrection. Um, so, uh, if you can remember your Paschal Vigil, the, the, the event begins in, outside the church. The Paschal candle represents Christ risen from the dead. And the actual moment of that is done, supposed to be done in the dark, the symbol of the darkness of, of, his, of hell and, the, and his sufferings. And so, the new fire is blessed by the priest, which is the symbol of the spirit, and the flame is touched to the candle. And then the, the flame is distributed to all the congregation, indicating that the light of Christ is also now communicated or transmitted to us, and we all have the resurrection in us too. And then you walk through the usually a darkened hall or into the church, which is still in the dark, all of which symbolizes the uh, passage of the Jewish folks through the Red Sea when all their sins, uh, uh, symbolized by the Egyptians, were destroyed in the waters. So, so the waters of baptism are like 
are, are symbols of the destructive power of water. And then baptism is the symbol of the healing powers of water. So the destructive waters are simply aimed at the consequences of sin and the liberation of that symbolically done by passing through the corridor as a, as a symbol of the Red Sea. So when we arrive in church with the lighted candles, the lights go on and the exalted is, is sung. But every time you go through this ritual, the teaching is that just as in baptism, all the consequences of our sins are destroyed in that walk. It's an exercise of faith if you attend the Paschal uh, liturgy, and, and, and hence it's, it's uh, the power of some of these archetypes is, is extremely strong uh, for Christians if, it's, uh, if they've ever understood what these symbols mean. And now in the exalted, you have that ex in, in, in extremely uh, important statement that Adam's sin was a happy fault. So this is quite a different attitude from thinking of Adam and Eve as a, as a disaster. So whatever the consequences of the fall, if there was a fall, or the fact that we're unevolved, which is a scientific explanation for the same problem, namely that we don't seem to be able to, to uh, follow our own uh, good resolutions and to be transformed. All of this is, is, is inviting us to a, a, an, an incredible trust in God. And so the Alleluia is in tone then, which is the song of those who are beginning to experience the risen life in them. And all I can say is Alleluia, which really means hooray. Alleluia. It just, it's just a word for a joy that is inexpressible. And you have to say something, so you say some gibberish. And it's been put into a certain order. Uh, notice the sound, Alleluia. So it begins and ends with A, the fundamental or primitive sound of all languages. And, and so it suggests restoration, renewal, return to the source, uh, recreation, and in Christian terms, it's a new creation that Christ has established. So all these ideas come tumbling at you from, you can't figure them all out in one year, but uh, what it's trying to say is, yes, hell, at least as a psychological state, exists, and that sometimes we find ourselves in something awful close to it, and, and sometimes, uh, but that it's only a passage, it's only a, a, a necessary preparation for the exercise or freeing up or liberation of all the gifts of Christ's resurrection that are, uh, in, in fact, empower us to lead the divine life in ordinary human affairs without the ordinariness changing. It is we who change and our attitude towards the ordinary with its uh, pain and suffering as well as joys. And, and so, what the experience of humility brings is transformation or the fullness of divine love. Humility and perfect love are two sides of the same reality. And so they, they, they arise at the same time and they mutually support each other and are really in, in, interchangeable. So, so humility is the acceptance of all reality. So it's consent. So that's why I say when you do centering prayer, you're consenting to all reality, beginning with that which is ultimate, namely God, and with Christ who is the mediator of all reality down to the human expression, and back again. So Christ doesn't just descend to uh, uh, identify with us. He then gathers us together, gets us to identify with him, 
and gathered us back into the Trinity. Uh, Jesus puts it this way. I have, uh, I have left the Father and come into the world, the incarnation. Now, he says to his disciples, I'm leaving the world and returning to the Father. This is the circular journey. But it includes us. So in the degree that Christ has identified with us, which is complete according to the fathers of the church, our identity with Christ is also complete. In other words, we become God in the degree that God became human. And this, is, everybody believes, is complete, total. So, so we have this inner conviction, even in the midst of suffering, that this, whatever it is, is part of the healing process or part of the overall transformation of society in which our generation may be called upon for special kinds of sufferings or difficulties or privations. But all of us are called to be part of this body that is gradually being transformed, which is actually the body of Christ. Paul calls it the mystical body of Christ. That is to say, it's the risen body of Christ extended into time and space through each generation that is living on earth and gathering them back generation after generation into the glorified body of Christ. So the, the fruits and gifts of the Spirit to bring it into everyday life are, are aspects of the mind of Christ. In other words, these are attitudes that that not just resemble, but are the way that uh, Jesus, as uh, the divine human person, uh, expressed in his daily life. And the chief one, of course, is, is his experience of ultimate reality, what he calls the Father, as, as a loving parent, as daddy, is the uh, translation of the Aramaic word. So, so it's that experience that Christ is communicating to us with so much trouble, and which we begin to experience when, by reducing the energy we put into false programs for happiness that can't work, we allow the gifts that are already present but not used to come off the shelf and begin to function and spontaneously change our attitudes into the mind and heart of Christ. Now, some of these, if you start thinking of them before you get to access them in some degree, are frightening. Because for one thing, we don't feel always ready to forgive everyone and everything, which is crucial. We, uh, we, we don't want to face some of the changes that the mind and heart of God seems to provide. So, so we can only do the best we can. And, and, and this is why a regular practice of contemplative prayer, like centering, that gradually helps us to adjust to these new dimensions in a human way, that is gradually, is so crucial. You cannot do this overnight. Maybe you can do it in the moment of death because of the uh, extreme circumstances of that state. Uh, but why wait till then? <laughs> it's better to start now and get some practice uh, in this project. Uh, let me uh, back this up for a moment with the uh, some of the uh, strong statements of Jesus, uh, a wisdom teacher says things uh, that are extreme sometimes to get people's attention. Uh, if, if you see the audience is falling asleep, you shout. Well, wisdom teachers, when they see people are not listening, say something shocking in order to get their attention. Then when you have their attention, you can insinuate the true doctrine. But if you don't do that and you give out this doctrine, they don't listen. People have extraordinary 
capacity only to listen to what they want to hear. And so if they don't want to hear what you're saying, you can be pretty sure they won't. And, and so when you get into challenging statements, you begin to lose more and more of the audience. So <laughs> uh, that's why it's good to go to uh, services every Sunday because uh, you have to hear it a few hundred times before you, <laughs> before you even begin to listen. That it's normal, that's not a surprise, or it doesn't mean ill will. So, so some of Jesus' wisdom sayings are deliberately very powerful and very striking. So here's one of them. Uh, if you try to save your life, it's in the Sermon on the Mount, meaning the false self, Remember, the false self is just a psychological contemporary term for what Paul called the old man. And remember, Paul says, strip off the old man and be renewed in the image of God and so forth. So, so Jesus says, you want to save your life, false self, with your illusory idea of your self-identity, you will bring yourself to ruin. But anyone, anyone at all, who brings himself, herself to nothing will find out who they are. Well, this is uh, an engaging or striking invitation. Because if you find out who you are, you find out that you really are the image of God. The true self is, is God manifesting in our uniqueness, and this image who we really are is quite different from whom we think we are or who have been brought up to think we are and are culturally conditioned to see certain signs that, that are agreed by most people that this is success or failure or whatever the cultural evaluation or judgment might be in different circumstances. So nothing means no thing. And then this is what is so profound about this saying. It, it's, a, it's not identifying ourselves with any objective or particular thing, including God, because God is not an object. Uh, objects are uh, creations of our thought patterns. So, so uh, it's our subjective experience of God that is, is the most reliable, not an objective idea which is bound to be conditioned by the limitations of our intellect, education, and cultural background. So this is an invitation to freedom, to be who you really are, which is who God thinks of you, and that's who you, we really are, not something we thought up. Uh, Again, uh, uh, another strong saying of Jesus that is appropriate here, I think, is his description of, or his ex experience with the young man who ran up to him on his last trip to Jerusalem saying, I'll follow you wherever you go, what must I do? And Jesus said, well, keep the commandments, that's a good start. And he said, well, I have kept all these commandments from my youth. And Jesus looked on him with great love and said, well, only one thing is missing. Go and sell everything you have and then and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. Well, he is a very rich young man and this caused him to be sad. Why? Obviously, he identified with his possession. You can have all the possessions in the world and it's not a problem. But if you identify or over-identify with them and have a possessive attitude towards them, you're poorer than a church mouse from the spiritual perspective. It's the possessive attitude towards things that makes you rich. Well, anyway, the, Jesus then said to the disciples how hard it is for a rich person to get into the kingdom of God. 
And disciples who were still in business were shocked at this and they uh, were very concerned. Now he didn't back off. Instead he said, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich person to get into the kingdom. Well, then they really lost it and said, threw up their hands saying, well, who then can be saved? Well, he said, well, uh, he moderated a little bit. He said, what's impossible with man is not impossible with God. But it's not wealth itself that is the problem here, but the possessive attitude towards anything, anything at all, because this is what hinders getting into the kingdom of perfect love. Uh, the kingdom of God is not a government or an uh, institution of some kind. It's a state of consciousness, and not any state of consciousness, but that which Jesus had towards the Father, who, remember, emptied himself completely into the Son, and then Jesus emptied himself into this world. In other words, there's no possessiveness at all in God. And so if you bring this attitude into the kingdom, you will feel very out of place. Nobody else has this attitude. They're there. So, so what's wrong with a possessive attitude? Everything belongs to everybody else. And... Uh, And so, richness doesn't just consist in wealth, but in anything that we possess, possessively, uh, such as your thoughts, your attitudes, your body, uh, your talents. This doesn't mean you don't use them, but the... <laughs> The invitation is to use them in the right way, not as your possession. Because possessive attitude reinforces the ego and the false self. And these are obstacles to the true self and to the kingdom of, of pure love. So, so what Jesus was trying to say is, Anything that you look over, identify with, is an obstacle to getting into the kingdom. Um, this statement has bothered a lot of people, in the, even exegetes down through the ages, and, and they, some even said, well, there's no evidence for it. Maybe there was a gate into the city of Jerusalem that was called the Camel's Gate. <laughs> in which case, the animal would just have to unload his baggage, or its baggage, and then get down on its hands and knees and wiggle through this narrow gate. But the point is still the same. Possessive attitudes are baggage. They're useless baggage, and they prevent you from getting through whatever the gate is, whether it's a gate or, a, or the eye of a needle. So to let go of the possessive attitude is the important point. Then you can use whatever goods are given you with the clarity of mind that is not worried or emotionally upset by the loss of anything or the loss of things that are dear to you. And I needn't remind us, I guess, that this total dispossessiveness is what happens to us at death or in the dying process. You, we can't take it with us. Why not? Because it would be obstacles to getting to heaven. So God mercifully takes everything from us in the process of dying. And it, it, it's, it's a great mercy looked at from this perspective. Um, And, and this, of course, is a great enlargement of the idea of what nothingness is. It really isn't nothing, it's no thing. Which means that you, uh, you are identifying with Christ's 
abandonment on the cross in which his self-identity as God seems to have been suspended, at least temporarily. So why be surprised if God himself lost the possession of being God, psychologically speaking? Why be surprised if God asks us in order to join this kingdom of perfect love by letting go of everything that we possess as a possessive attitude? It's, it's attributing the things to me, this is egoic activity, that is the mistake. When everything belongs to us, if you let go of everything. So, so the advantage of being no thing is that you become everything. And when you become everything, you become God who is everything. So God doesn't need to possess because he has everything, but not in a possessive way. Possessing, possessiveness is exclusive. It turns us in on ourselves. It gives rise to fears to defend it and violence if, if, it's, if it's attacked. But, but this is the mistake. And, and, and this is the, the kind of cosmic consciousness that the exercise of these gifts that God has given us in baptism and grace begins to develop in us. In other words, one begins to perceive the oneness of all human beings. One perceives the, the superficiality or the unreasonableness of boundaries. For instance, it's now clear as crystal from science that the differences among human beings is about one or two percent at the most as a result of race or gender or nationality or some other thing. In other words, we're completely misjudging all of life most of the time, chiefly because we've all done this and this is what you learn as children and so on. So the cultural conditioning gives us a whole set of ideas that are just plain and need to be reevaluated when we come to adulthood. And because we don't, most people don't do that, you have to wait till the midlife crisis and sometimes that doesn't work. And you wait for senility in old age when it will work, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so, so the passion of Christ then is this invitation to join or identify with Christ in becoming nothing in order to become God or everything. Because that is available to everybody on the basis of non-possessive attitude. It does not mean you can't use all the things of this world. So you can be richer than, a, than, than these billionaires <laughs> if you're attached to a pen or a particular uh, thought, or a particular pair of old shoes, <laughs> anything. Uh, some things are easier to let go of than others. But uh, a, a, a billionaire like Abraham or David, there were some very holy people who were very rich. Apparently they were able to have all this wealth without a possessive attitude, at least as they progressed in their spiritual journey. So what are these wonderful expressions of the resurrection that begin to emerge into daily life as the result of our opening and accepting the mystery of the Paschal? Uh, mystery which is both death and resurrection at the same time. Uh, this is this, this growing sense of the unity of the human family, of the closeness of God, of our, of our own human weakness and capacity without grace for any evil, and at the same time, a boundless confidence in God expressed by the psalm 
I put all my trust in you. All my hope is in you. And it's this balance between our awareness of weakness, trust in God, the awareness of our nothingness, and our uh, trust in God's goodness, and the, uh, and the awareness of our sinfulness without being at least bit discouraged. Uh, this is the, uh, the contentment or the peace that is a balance between these two things. And, uh, and the grace of the resurrection is, is, uh, is trying to teach us this in the course of events. And everything, every creature becomes one's teacher. Uh, Paul's experience is, is, is extremely valuable to understand this, it seems to me, when he says, uh, after his great visions, when he was uh, pulled up to the third heaven and he saw things that can't be said, they were so profound. And then he says, in order to prevent me from being too elated by these visions, God sent me a thorn of the flesh. And I plead with him three times to take it away. And uh, three times is a symbol of uh, desperation or completion. And, and God uh, didn't do anything about it. Somewhat the way Christ didn't do anything about Lazarus when he was dying. Because this experience had to be completed for the healing to take place. Now, in Paul's case, he was very advanced. And here was a guy who was working himself to death for Christ. He was the only apostle who went all over the world. He went everywhere preaching the good news of God's love for us. And what did he get in return? He was stoned, shipwrecked, bitten by asps, uh, rejected, had to escape from various groups, stoned. <laughs> and that, then they put a thorn of the flesh that wouldn't go away. Who is this God who treats his friends in this way? So Paul finally said to, him, said to God, take it away, I'm sick of being injured. And uh, wouldn't you think that he would have gotten a little help here and there uh, to relieve his, his struggles? God's answer to him was, my, my grace is made perfect in weakness. And, uh, and so he wouldn't take away his affliction, whatever it was, we really don't know what it is. So then Paul says, well, gladly will I boast of my weaknesses and infirmities that the power of God may be manifest in me. This does not sound like a success story to me. <laughs> he, he was not receiving an Oscar for outstanding performance in the ministry. He was just dumped into his own weakness and powerlessness. So, so it's, it's the acceptance of our shadow side or our weakness or what we can do that is the shortest and straightest route to divine union. Why this is so, I, I'll leave to your imagination. But it, it occurs again and again in, 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 in all of the spiritual literature, but especially in, in Christ. Here is God's Son who receives, as far as we can see in his passion, nothing but neglect, forgetfulness, abandonment, rejection. The point is, he was dealing with the Father at a different level from our rational consciousness. Therefore, rational judgments don't make sense at this point. 
It doesn't mean they happen to value, it just means there's a whole bunch of reality that transcends any human judgment. A another thing that's puzzling for humans is that this world is not governed by justice. So that if you work very hard for God and keep all the commandments and fulfill all your duties, it doesn't mean you're going to be rich or happy. It simply means <laughs> that, that uh, you have to have a different understanding of what, of what God may be asking you to do because of the oneness of the human family and your identification with Christ in his risen life, God expects us to absorb some of the attitudes or dispositions that Christ had. And one of these is, is to lay down his life for us. So in other words, other people are so much one with this, that their sufferings are really ours, and ours theirs, and their virtues are ours, and ours theirs. But in addition to that, we can, we're invited to go even further, and to freely participate, or fill up, as Paul puts it, what is wanting to the sufferings of Christ. So your toothache or your sore toe is not yours <laughs> alone. It, it, it may be helping or in God's plan, everybody or people you don't even know or may never know in this world. Our, uh, 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 we're a cell in the mystical body, according to Paul's paradigm, which means that you're sent to heal or to work for the body, not for yourself. And that it may not, uh, we, we, we all may be in a generation that is in an especially difficult one where the suffering abounds or is, uh, or is overwhelming for a great part of humanity. But that doesn't mean the world is, is necessarily coming to an end, it simply means that that we are called to balance the negativity of human misconduct by the exercise of, of the love of God and charity. And if we do that, then the consequences of the, of the evil that's being done can be offset. In other words, there's a kind of spiritual ecology that, uh, that the divine nature establishes so that you have no idea uh, of the amount of good you can do through contemplative prayer and the capacity to suffer for God or for this body insofar as that may happen. It doesn't mean not taking pills, but it does mean that when you can't, uh, when, when something is God's will for you, some disappointment or tragedy, that you may be in the position of Lazarus that this is sent to happen so that you can awaken to the fullness of God's life, but above all, that you may contribute to the transformation, not just of yourselves, but of the whole human family. And, uh, and so there's many secrets that God has that begin to be revealed to us as we exercise the mind of Christ in daily life, and, and begin to move beyond those gifts to what might be called Christ consciousness or cosmic consciousness, in which you are aware in more and more instances of life of the oneness of, of everything that exists and in fact the oneness that science itself on the level of particle physics and others is beginning to reinforce. In other words, science has become a revelation of God's thoughts. And interestingly enough, it, it reinforces some of the mystical insights of the world religions. And, uh, and so we shouldn't look upon science as enemies, but as, uh, as another religion of sorts, you might say that happens to have a, something that's never happened before 
a study of the inner nature of things that reveals God's thoughts. Uh, there's all kinds of new paradigms from the brain research, from cellular structure of living beings that reinforces this unity of, uh, of every level of life at the deepest level. It reinforces to the, the uh, relationship uh, with ourselves and with God. Take the meeting, here's where the gospel is, is, is so intriguing because the incidents are really symbols of grace. And when they're celebrated in the liturgy, they really communicate that grace in a, in, with a special force. But take Mary of Magdalene meeting Jesus in the garden after his resurrection. So she thinks he's the gardener, so that means he, he, he didn't, she didn't immediately perceive him as Christ. And then he calls her by name and she recognizes him. And then she throws himself into his arms and uh, clings to him. And, uh, and then Jesus says, stop hanging on to me because I haven't yet risen to my father. But go and tell the disciples that I've risen to my father and your father. So notice that Christ has has understood and is communicating the fact that, that he has so identified us and made us one in his passion, that everything he has is ours if we consent, including his union with the Father, including his, uh, when we say the Our Father, which means that we're supposed to experience through the Spirit the same Abba crying out in us, that cried out in Christ. And so, so this unity and oneness is, is what we were created to enjoy, but because of the human condition, we haven't perceived it yet, at least on the broad spectrum of, of the majority of human beings. And, and this, the Paschal mystery, begins to open up uh, with, an, with enormous proportions. We celebrate, of course, the passion for Holy Week. That's just six days or so. But the resurrection we celebrate for about 50 days. And the ascension is really the celebration of our return with Christ to the bosom of the Father by way of anticipation. So the ascension symbolizes uh, cosmic or Christ consciousness or, or unity consciousness. The resurrection celebrates bridal marriage with Christ or with God. Union or you, but unity is a further stage of development in which uh, the, our identity is, is, is uh, entrusted to God so that we only want to be what God wants us to be. And, and God's will is all the thing that is the chief thing we're interested in, in every situation. And the ascension is the mystery that's celebrated that refers to what might be called unity consciousness, where there is no separation between us and God on any level, except that he, God remains uh, God and we remain distinct but never separate from God. And, and so that period of celebration goes on for 50 days. So the proportion between the struggles of dying to the false self and rising to the true self or the new creation, the emphasis is obviously both in time and, and, and space on the, on the joy of of the new life, which is the divine life that Christ is imparting to us through contemplative prayer. And the sacraments and all the other services we do, but contemplative prayer throws a light on where they're going or why we're doing these things. 
and invites us to reduce the self-centered programs that enter even into our religious practice at times or our spiritual uh, journey. Hence, to desire prayer for the sake of its, of its uh, consolations would be a mistake. But just to uh, be with God without expectation and to recognize that the level that we are invited to participate in the divine life transcends any faculty we have to interpret it exactly as it is into our own life or consciousness. Is, enables God to be always present because we don't ask for any human signs or any human evidence. We just know that it's there. Not by intellectual knowledge, but by the love that brings the conviction uh, based on experience and faith. And so as we get nearer to the Easter mystery, the fullness of resurrection and the symbol of the new life, the divine life that we've been given and now is being awakened by the grace of God. The primary disposition we need to have is unconditional love for one another, a quiet joy based on unlimited confidence in God, and, and the peace that can experience reassurance in the midst of any or all tragedy, disaster, including death itself. Perceived now not as a, as a tough thing you have to go through, but as the necessary completion of our spiritual journey that needs to move beyond our bodily form in order to experience God just as he is. If we experienced him now that way, the fire, heat of divine love would push the soul right out of the body. you turn into a grease spot. So God has to hide himself behind secondary causes. So when you look at any event, however tragedy, it has layers of meaning and communication with God. And we, so we have to be cautious in identifying just with the tragic side. However much we feel it, there's a level of reassurance that is also present. The final communion, God's will to save everyone and his goodness which triumphs uh, through his love over every difficulty.